Hey everyone, I'm John Reed, host of Learn to Stargaze, astronomer and author of the Things to See with a Telescope series. In this video, I'm going to show you in detail how to use a refractor telescope on an AZ mount. If you have an equatorially mounted telescope, that's one that looks like this and has EQ in the name, see our video on that topic. I'll post a link in the description below. This video is a follow-up to last year's video on how to use any telescope. So if you don't have a telescope yet, you might want to check that video out first. So here we have a basic refractor telescope. These are one of my favorite types of beginner telescopes because they're really easy to use. Refractors use a lens to collect light from space. The light then gets refracted or bent by the lens, travels down the telescope tube. The light then bounces off a diagonal and into an eyepiece where it's brought into focus in your eye, allowing you to see a magnified version of the object you're observing. Note that the magnification of the telescope is the focal length of the telescope divided by the focal length in the eyepiece. In other words, the lower the focal length of the eyepiece, the higher the magnification. But counterintuitively, when observing objects with a telescope, lower magnifications are often preferable. This is the National Geographic 102mm refractor, which I bought at Costco last year for around $200. Typically, the number in the name of a telescope refers to the aperture. That's the diameter of the primary lens. The aperture of the telescope determines the resolution of the telescope. The larger the aperture, the more detailed objects will appear. 102 millimeters is an extremely popular size for a telescope lens. There are 102 millimeter refractors from several brands, and most of these telescopes are generally pretty good. Now let's talk about this mount for a moment. This is an altazimuth mount. You may hear it called an AZ mount which effectively stands for altitude and azimuth. This simply means that the telescope is designed to move along this axis, the azimuth axis, left and right, and this axis, the altitude axis, up and down. This also corresponds to how this telescope is used to point at things in the sky. As you move the telescope left and right, the direction the telescope is pointing is changing in azimuth. In other words, the scope is moving parallel to the horizon. The other axis is altitude. This corresponds to how high the telescope is pointed above the horizon. The farthest point above the horizon is the zenith. A beginner telescope should easily be able to point both at the horizon and all the way up to the zenith. Now this refractor telescope can be moved in two ways. First, for large movements, you can simply push the tube to approximately where you want it to go. The second way to move the telescope is with fine adjustments. These are the slow motion controls. They're used to move the telescope with very precise movements, and also to help you track objects as they move across the sky. This is the finder. It's used to help point the telescope at the correct spot in the sky. This is a red dot style finder, which tend to be included with most beginner telescopes these days. These finders take 2032 batteries. It's best to have extra 2032 batteries on hand because if you're unable to use the finder, finding things in the sky can be nearly impossible. Your telescope may have a finder telescope. Now I find these more challenging to use, however they can be helpful in the city because they enable you to see stars that are not visible to the unaided eye. And they're helpful in dark skies when searching for deep sky objects because oftentimes you can see the deep sky object in the finder scope itself. In any case, if you're just setting up your telescope, the first thing you need to do is make sure that the finder and the telescope are pointed at exactly the same spot. This is far easier to do during the day than at night, and you should check the alignment of your finder every time you use your telescope. You're going to start by adding a high focal length, low powered eyepiece to the diagonal. Don't be surprised if the image in the telescope appears backwards. In astronomy, we call this near reversed. Some refractors come with an erecting eyepiece, which uses a prism to flip the image back to normal. I found these to be less common and are typically used on telescopes designed for looking at things on Earth. Now, if you have a red dot finder, turn it on with this knob here. Then center the telescope on a distant object like the top of a flagpole, a chimney, or a street light. If you're doing this at night, I typically use a bright star. You just need to make sure that the telescope and the finder are pointed at the same bright star. Then use this knob here to move the finder up and down, and this knob here to move the finder left and right. For finder telescopes, these have three knobs, but the process is basically the same. When you think you've got the finder lined up with your target, move between the telescope and the finder just to confirm that both the finder and the telescope are pointed at exactly the same spot. You may also want to take this time to focus the telescope, but we'll talk about that later as you'll need to refocus the telescope for looking at space and anytime you switch eyepieces. This is the diagonal. It contains a mirror or prism to direct light from the telescope into the eyepiece. 
These typically come in two types, 90 degree diagonals and 45 degree diagonals. The 90 degree diagonals, like this one, are used for looking at things in space. Whereas the 45 degree diagonals, like this one, are typically used for looking at things on Earth. If your telescope included a Barlow, I recommend you don't use this for a while. Barlows are used to increase the focal length of the telescope. This increases the magnification, but it makes objects in space far more difficult to find. Typically, Barlows are used after you've centered a planet in the eyepiece and you're attempting to go in for a closer look. This is the focusing knob. You'll need to focus the telescope every time you switch eyepieces, and oftentimes you may need to refocus the telescope every time you switch users if stargazing with friends. This is because some people, me included, like to stargaze without eyeglasses. And you're effectively focusing the telescope to your prescription. The telescope is in focus when the objects you're observing appear detailed and sharp, and the stars in the image are as small as you can possibly make them. Speaking of eyepieces, which eyepiece should you use? Typically, your telescope comes with two eyepieces, one with a high focal length for general observing, and a second, generally a smaller eyepiece designed for zooming in on planets or craters on the moon. Regardless of what you're planning to observe, you always want to start with the low-powered, high focal length eyepiece. For example, this telescope came with a 25 millimeter eyepiece. This is the eyepiece we'll use for finding our targets, and for the most part, this is the eyepiece I'll use for most of my observing. If you're observing a planet like Saturn and you want a closer look, first find and center the target with the lower powered eyepiece, then remove it and replace it with the higher powered eyepiece. At this point, you'll need to refocus the telescope with the focusing knobs and most likely recenter the target with the slow motion controls as the object may have drifted across and out of your field of view. It's important to note that zooming in with a higher powered eyepiece, although the image will appear closer, will not gain any detail. It's sort of like reading a book. If you bring the book closer to your face, the words will appear larger, but it won't make the story any better. That said, astronomers will often experiment with different eyepieces until they've found the view they find most pleasing. There is a lot to know about eyepieces, and I get asked about upgrades quite a bit. The best advice is to get proficient in observing with the eyepieces that came with your telescope before you consider upgrading. If you are considering upgrading, I recommend simply upgrading to a higher quality eyepiece of the same focal length as the ones that came with your telescope. Some advice for stargazing and stargazing with refractors in particular, stargaze from a chair. This is especially helpful if you're observing objects high in the sky. Make sure you're outside with a clear view of the horizon. Telescopes do not work well from inside when pointed through a window. You'll also want to be on solid ground. A deck will transmit vibrations through the tripod and into the eyepiece, making the image shake, and that's just not any fun. Now that the telescope is in focus and the finder is aligned, it's time to start thinking about what you're going to observe and how you're going to find the objects in the sky. If you're new to astronomy, I recommend starting with the moon, which is pretty easy to find, assuming that's in the sky at the time. The moon is great for learning to focus the telescope and tracking it as it moves across the sky. As the phases of the moon change from night to night, there's always something new to see. For a deep dive into the lunar craters, check out my book, 50 Things to See on the Moon, which won the RASC Simon Newcomb Award back in 2020. For planets, it's best to use stargazing software like Stellarium to determine which planets are visible at a given time and where they'll be in the sky. Planets like Saturn, Jupiter, Venus, and Mars are a lot of fun to observe, and you don't need dark skies. They'll look the same from downtown in a city as they will from the countryside. For other objects like star clusters, nebulae, and galaxies, a simple stargazing book like 50 Things to See with a Telescope or A Kid's Guide to the Night Sky is far better than a stargazing app. Stargazing apps often oversell what you're realistically able to see, and some of the targets in the software require a camera and long exposures to be resolved at all. Speaking of cameras, once you try to attach a camera to your telescope, you've left the hobby of stargazing altogether and entered the realm of astrophotography. Now, we talk a lot about astrophotography on this channel, but that hobby, while addictive, can be extremely frustrating and typically far removed from the relaxing night under the stars such as the stargazing experience provides. As I said, the moon and planets can be observed from the city. However, most objects like galaxies and nebulae require darker skies, and the darker the better. If you're attempting to observe objects like galaxies M81 and M82, the darkness of your skies, not the quality of your telescope, will be the biggest determinant of your success. For dark skies, you need to be far from city lights. 
you want skies that are free of clouds, and you want a night where the moon is either in its early phases or not in the sky at all. I recommend using a light pollution map online to help you find the darkest skies nearest you. Once you're ready to move beyond the moon and planets and beyond the night's most popular showcase targets like the Orion Nebula in winter and the Great Globular Cluster in Hercules in the summer, most people attempt to observe the targets from the Messier list. The Messier list is a 200-year-old set of objects catalogued by the French astronomer Charles Messier. Now, several organizations, including the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada and the Astronomical League in the USA, will provide you with a certificate for observing the objects in this list. If that's something you're interested in, check out our book 110 Things to See with a Telescope. Each target has a customized star map and an observing log so you can record your observation and make progress toward earning your certificate. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video on observing with a refractor telescope. Be sure to subscribe to Learn to Stargaze so you don't miss the next video. Consider supporting us on Patreon, and remember, the future is looking up. Ready? 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 Go on.